I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm Shanna Stevenson. I'm the current president of the Governor's Mansion Foundation. I wanted to recognize uh, several folks that you might know that are here today. Um, uh, Justice Alexander, retired Washington Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice. Want to wave? <laughs> <laughs> don't know if I see um, Mark Fouch who's the former mayor of Olympia uh, Les Eldridge who's the former Thurston County Commissioner uh, Captain Alan Schrader who we're going to hear from here shortly uh, council member, uh, Olympia Council member Jim Cooper. And I would like to introduce our current mayor, uh, Mayor Cheryl Selby. I don't think I need that. <laughs> Maybe it's in the way, so I'll step on it. Um, greetings, good afternoon. So on behalf of the city of Olympia, I'm happy to be here to celebrate the city's namesake, the cruiser USS Olympia, and to welcome Captain Schrader to town. I also want to thank Mrs. Inslee for opening up her beautiful home for us today. I have to be honest, when I first got the invitation to attend the USS Olympia Silver Program, I didn't quite know what to prepare for. Thanks to Shanna Stevenson and Google, I now have a great appreciation for the heritage of not only uh, namesake Navy ships, but their presentation silver as well. Did you know that there's a Facebook page that celebrates Navy food service? There's a Facebook page for everything, and I found it. Um, th there I found out some fascinating facts on the history of Navy presentation silver dating back to the 1800s. Do you know, here's your trivia for tonight, do you know which city was the first to be honored by having a naval ship named after it and with receiving the first set of presentation silver? You can't answer. Anybody? Chicago. Chicago. USS Chicago. And I had a Olympia pin here for somebody if they had the right answer. So, sorry, maybe I'll come up with another another question. Um, once uh, the presentation silver had been a widespread custom, ships commissioned today often do not receive the traditional gifts of silver. These ships rely on the older services that are commonly reassigned to them from a ship that has been decommissioned. Silver services on board ships, we'll hear more about this later, um, host receptions for foreign leaders and those closer to home play host to local dignitaries. No matter what purpose they are used for, it proves that presentation silver still carries on a significant and important tradition in today's Navy as they shine from sea to shining sea. So in that context, we are thrilled that the U.S. Navy has chosen to loan the presentation silver to the state where it can be enjoyed by the many guests and visitors to the beloved governor's mansion. So let's give a round of applause to the Navy, the City of Olympia, her ship and its silver. So with that, I'll um, hand it back over to Shannon. And of course, we're, we're delighted uh, to welcome Captain Alan Schrader, who's the commanding officer of Navy Base Kitsap. So, Captain Schrader. All right, I'll try this as well. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. Um, didn't, I, I too, just like the mayor, didn't know what to expect. And uh, everything that I wrote down here, I'm just going to put it in my back pocket here. So <laughs> it can be a little dangerous, so no public math, please. Uh, I don't have it here. But uh, I, I, I was asked to kind of come up here and on behalf of the Navy, first of all, say thank you. Uh, thank you for supporting us uh, day in and day out as we do our mission. I don't know if you know, but uh, Naval Region Northwest encompasses 11 states, including Alaska. Uh, we have four main, Navy, but the four main Navy bases of that region are here. Navy Base Kitsap, Whidbey Island, NAVMAG, Indian Island, and Everett. And uh, between those four bases, you know, we have over almost 90,000 active duty Navy personnel, civilians that work for us, and contractors. 
And those four bases also support almost 100,000 EV retirees. In fact, DOD retirees, I should say, across the board. When I say those numbers and I talk about even just Naval Base Kitsap having eight Trident missile submarines, three fast attack submarines, and two aircraft carriers, I think those numbers often kind of come across as, wow, I just didn't realize we had that many people, ships, and first of all, Naval and Marine Corps Coast Guard personnel, you know, manning that. So um, rest assured, your Navy presence in the Puget Sound area is extremely strong, extremely important. And why we are here and why we've been here for about 126 years, uh, I think much longer than the Army. I know I had some Army folks in here. But, uh, <laughs> you know, starting back with the Bremerton Shipyard, which is now Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, uh, we have been here for well over a century doing the mission quietly across from Seattle and then into those other bases, which also today, by the way, is the 75th birthday for Naval Air Station Whidbey Island. So uh, on behalf of uh, Admiral Mays, who's my boss, who couldn't be here, he's up there celebrating their birthday. And uh, I get to come here and, and see Olympia Silver and hear the stories and, and share some Navy uh, tradition uh, with you all. So. I'm not going to talk anymore. I, thank you for having me. Thank you for supporting the Navy here in the Pacific Northwest. Your Navy sailors and Marines and Coast Guard men are doing great things throughout the world. I just saw a little post today from USS Nimitz, one of our main aircraft carriers and tenants, uh, doing good things in the Arabian Gulf. And we look forward to them coming back safely and securely in December and then sending out John C. Stennis next year. That's what we do. That's what a Navy does, turn ships and put them to sea. Very quietly, we've been putting our SSBNs to sea for, for decades as well. So, um, again, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed seeing the black USS Olympia, you know, about 360 feet long, uh, about 33 feet in uh, draft, and uh, displacing about 9,000 tons. I just saw that uh, several months ago. Uh, and it, when I met the crew and the commanding officer, and when, when they pulled into Bremerton, uh, there was many folks from, US, from the Olympia area, from the Washington area there to welcome them. And that kind of support goes so, so far for our Navy and Marine Corps folks across the board. So we are very lucky that uh, the secretaries of the Navy in the past have decided that we're going to name ships after cities and states because you get a lot of support from uh, folks like you all uh, when your namesake is uh, in, uh, on a ship driving up the river, going out to do national security type events. So thank you for your continued support of the Navy. Thank you for your continued support of USS Olympia, I'll say, and Bremerton, and the new USS Washington. Yeah, yeah. so uh, your, your support is being felt around the world uh, Navy-wide. So thank you very much for having me today. I'm uh, delighted to introduce our first presenter this afternoon, and it's Megan Churchwell. Uh, she's the curator of the Puget Sound Navy Museum, and she's going to be talking about the ceremonial life of U.S. Navy ships. So, Megan? All right, thanks for having me here today. So, as the curator of the Navy Museum, uh, my focus is on the naval history and heritage of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're one of 10 official U.S. Navy museums all around the country, uh, but since we're located next to the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, uh, we really have a, a local Washington focus. And before we really dive into the history of this beautiful USS Olympia Silver, which I hope you've all had a chance to see, uh, I want to take a moment to focus on some of the traditions of the U.S. Navy. Uh, so first, I'll share some important traditions in the life of a ship, and then I'll focus specifically on tr the tradition of presentation silver. So first, I want to talk about two groups of people who are very important to the ceremonial life of the ship. Uh, the first central figure is the sponsor, and this is chosen by the Secretary of the Navy, and it's generally a woman who is selected for her relationship either to the namesake of the ship or to the ship's mission. And during the christening ceremony, she's the one who officially names the vessel and breaks that ceremonial bottle of wine against the ship's hull. Uh, afterwards, the sponsor usually stays in contact with the ship and the crew 
and might be involved in special events such as homecomings. And of course, the ship couldn't come alive without her crew. The plank owners are the sailors who are with the ship from her very beginning. These sailors have an immense responsibility to turn the ship from a metal vessel into a living, fighting, manned warship. The naval term plank owner started back in the days of wooden sailing ships when sailors slept on the deck. And because some planks of the deck were more comfortable than others, the crew would choose the, the best planks to sleep on and in time they'd see them as their own. And when the ship was eventually dismantled, uh, crew members could actually lay claim to their plank of wood as a reminder of their seagoing days. And this sense of ownership felt by a ship's crew has carried this naval term uh, into the 20th century to today's steel warships. So how do these groups fit into the many traditions that come with bringing a ship to life? This begins with the first milestone in the history of a ship. It's the ceremony which marks the laying of the keel. The laying of the keel is a formal start of the construction process. Back in the days of wooden sailing ships, it meant the placement of that central timber making up the backbone of the ship. In the era of steel ships, this transitioned to a central steel beam. Now today, modern warships are usually made in a series of prefabricated sections of hull, uh, rather than with one long beam, but the keel laying event remains and now revolves around the lowering of the first pre-built section into place. During this keel laying ceremony, the ship's sponsor often etches her initials into the keel plate to verify that the ship's keel has been laid. And as with many ship ceremonies, this keel laying is said to bring luck to the ship and the crew. Shipbuilders have some other traditions while the ship is being built. In one centuries old tradition, coins are placed at the base of a ship's mast during construction. This is a practice that actually goes back to at least the ancient Romans. It was thought to bring good luck to a ship and to her crew. And according to some legends, uh, the meaning of the coin was to provide payment to the underworld should they become shipwrecked. The Navy adopted this ceremony as one part of its traditional shipbuilding practice. Next, the ship's ceremonial life continues through the christening and launching of the new ship. Uh, again, this tradition of christening a ship go goes back to ancient times and was initially performed for good luck. The Greeks drank wine to honor the gods and sprinkled water on the new boat as a blessing. Ancient Egyptians Greeks and Romans all called on their gods to protect sailors, often by offering up sacrificial beverages when launching the ship. Babylonians sacrificed an ox, while ancient Vikings offered up human blood. Each of these traditions stems from a desire to protect the ships and sailors in an era when sailing meant an incredibly perilous journey. And in Great Britain, this tradition evolved into a ceremony involving drinking from a special cup made of precious metals and then pouring the leftover liquid onto the ship and tossing the cup overboard. Uh, eventually, this was replaced with the more economical version of breaking a wine bottle across the bow. Throughout the 1800s, this ritual remained in uh, both the English and American navies, though the fluid itself varied from whiskey to wine to water. USS Maine, the Navy's first steel battleship, was christened with champagne in 1890, sparking a shift to this sparkling wine. When Prohibition went into effect in America, ships were launched with water, juice, or apple cider. Champagne came back after Prohibition, and it's stuck around ever since. This christening ceremony often incorporates other elements as well. Shown here is a ceremonial hatchet from the launching of USS Olympia in 1892, uh, which is now in my museum's collection. Unfortunately, uh, little information has survived regarding the christening ceremony and how this hatchet might have been used. Finally, uh, there's one more ceremony to bring the ship to life, and it's known as commissioning, which is the act of placing the ship in active service. That's when I'm a fit a vessel officially becomes a United States ship with the prefix USS before its name. 
In the early U.S. Navy, this was a simple military ceremony. An officer was simply commanded to take charge of a newly built warship, and that was that. Uh, commissions weren't surrounded by any public fanfare. But in recent decades, commissionings have become more public occasions. A commissioning ceremony is usually filled with speeches from flag officers, civil leaders, and other distinguished visitors, and the ship's sponsor plays a role in the event. The aircraft carrier USS Nimitz is one example of the typical commissioning ceremony as it's held today. On May 3, 1975, more than 20,000 people witnessed the commissioning of USS Nimitz at Norfolk, Virginia. That's the ceremony that's shown here. The carrier's sponsor, daughter of Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, was introduced, and President Ford was the main speaker. This commissioning ceremony is often when gifts to the ship are presented as well. These gifts might be offered by the sponsor, the builder, or representatives of the namesake city or state. The commanding officer is the one to accept the gifts on behalf of the crew. These time-honored naval customs and traditions, beginning with the keel laying and continuing through the commissioning, help welcome a warship into the fleet. One of the biggest components uh, of bringing a warship to life is giving it a name. Have you ever wondered how naval ships get their name? Well, each era has set out a somewhat preset naming convention, though this is not always followed, and it has changed a lot over the years. Early U.S. Navy ship names came from a variety of sources. Famous naval heroes, early patriots, uh, the young nation's ideals reflected in names like Independence and America, other ship names honored American places like Boston or Virginia. Official ship naming conventions were established by Congress in the early 1800s uh, when an act of Congress formally placed the responsibility for sh assigning ship names in the hands of the Secretary of the Navy. And this is still the case today. Over the years, there have been various rules written into the code for ship naming. For instance, in 1898, it was specified that battleships should only be named after states, not cities, places, or people. However, the procedures involved in choosing a name for a ship are as much, if not more, products of tradition as of legislation. The names for new ships are personally decided by the Secretary of the Navy. The Secretary can rely on many sources to help him reach decisions. Uh, including the history of the Navy and suggestions submitted by service members, Navy veterans, and members of the public. While there's no set time for assigning a name, it's usually announced right before the ship is christened. The ship names, especially those uh, bearing the names of cities and states, are often reused in subsequent generations. However, at any given name, at any given time, there can only be one ship of each name in commission in order to avoid confusion. At the end of a ship's life in the active Navy, it is decommissioned. This ceremony marks the end of a ship's active service, and it has the added advantage of freeing up the name used by the ship. This allows vessels currently in the planning or building stages to inherit the name. So the first USS Olympia, the cruiser, was in service from 1895 until 1922. And though she still exists today as a museum ship, she has been decommissioned, which freed up her name to be reused. The next USS Olympia, uh, SSN 717, is a submarine and the second ship to be named for Olympia. She was commissioned in, 18, in 1984 and is still in active duty today. In the future, once she is decommissioned, it is likely that the name will be reused on another kind of ship or submarine. So how will the Navy name its ships in the future? Well, it seems safe to say that the evolutionary process of the past will continue, and as the fleet itself changes, so will the names given to its ships. But it seems equally safe to say that future decisions will continue to take into account the rich history of the Navy, and that the name Olympia will live on. Uh, one of the aspects of choosing a ship's name is that now the ship has a namesake, and uh, 
that uh, forges a strong link between a particular city or state and the ship. And one of the traditions that this has led to is the presentation of a silver service. This is a long-standing tradition in the U.S. Navy, and uh, it actually began with a silver tea service given by the citizens of Boston when the frigate Boston was constructed in 1799. However, important to note is that this silver service was gifted not to the ship, but to a person, Edmund Hart, the master carpenter who owned the shipyard where the Boston was built. In the decades following that first presentation of silver, gifts of silver were given to other American naval heroes. For instance, in 1854, an elaborate set of 381 pieces was presented by the New York City Chamber of Commerce to Matthew Galbraith Perry, a Commodore known as the father of the Steam Navy, for, him, for his role in modernizing the U.S. Navy. Many of the pieces given to him are now on display at the New York Historical Society. By the late 1880s, it became much more common to name ships after cities and states, and the tradition shifted to the ships themselves receiving the presentation silver. An early example is USS Chicago, which received an elaborate 224-piece coffee service in 1889. This sterling silver set featured engravings depicting the Great Chicago Fire and local landmarks. And today, the service can still be found on the ship on the city's actively serving namesake, the submarine USS Chicago. Sets of presentation silver are generally gifted by the residents of the namesake city or state. Past fundraising efforts have ranged from donations given by successful businessmen to penny drives held in schools. The sets themselves were often presented to ships during public ceremonies that were widely attended. And as we hear later this afternoon, the USS Olympia set, in particular, has quite an interesting origin story. Over the past two centuries, examples of presentation silver have included punch bowls, tea or coffee sets, trays, candelabras, and silverware. It's usually engraved with the names of the vessel and major donors, along with symbols of the Navy or scenes of the city's history. Well-known silver makers have been called upon to design and craft these silver services, including Tiffany, Gorham, and Reed and Barton. However, while once a widespread custom, ships commissioned today often don't receive the traditional gift of silver. These ships rely on older services that are reassigned to them from a ship that has been decommissioned. The elaborate sets of decades past have fallen out of favor and ships that are fortunate to have a silver service donated to them today often receive silver plated sets of a much simpler design. They may be smaller in size, but these gifts are still highly treasured by the crews that receive them. These silver sets are typically displayed in a place of honor in the captain's cabin. They are primarily viewed as decorative, not unlike a painting or a sculpture. Though not used daily, there would be opportunities for occasional use during special dinners, teas, and other formal occasions. Though rarely used for food or drink, they still serve a role in many ceremonial occasions. Ships overseas host receptions for foreign leaders. Those closer to home play host to local dignitaries. In both cases, the silver is often brought out for display aboard the ship. And today, presentation silver continues to carry a significant um, role in today's Navy. Since they are so important ceremonially, there are a set of rules governing the silver sets aboard ships. U.S. Code authorizes the Secretary of the Navy to accept and care for gifts of silver and other ceremonial gifts. They can be presented to the ship by states, cities, organizations, or individuals. And other than silver, uh, commemorative gifts given to ships can also include paintings, portraits, engraved clocks, original historic documents, and a range of other items. The U.S. Navy becomes the official owner of the silver, except when they've been permanently returned to the donor by the Secretary of the Navy. Some presentation silver sets have a history of being temporarily returned to donors as a loan when there's no ship with that name 
in active service or when the ship doesn't have room uh, for the set, as may be the case with submarines. <coughs> One of the interesting side notes of presentation silver sets is that they were usually carried aboard the ship itself. And this, of course, poses some danger to the silver, and many historical examples were lost when the ship carrying them sank. During wartime, sil silver services were typically removed from their ships and placed into storage to be returned when the ships came safely home. However, th this didn't always happen, as was the case of the USS Indiana. Its silver service was made by Tiffany and presented by the citizens of Indiana in 1896. During the Spanish-American War, the silver was not removed to storage, but was kept in its usual location, the captain's cabin. And on July 4th, 1898, a mortar shot the quarterdeck of the Indiana and exploded inside. A fragment of this shell passed through the cabin into the silver cabinet. And it's said that it was later discovered embedded in the side of the punch bowl, leaving a still visible dent. Fortunately, there are many surviving examples of presentation silver throughout the Navy. There are more than 8,500 pieces of silver in the Navy's current inventory. Besides the Olympia set here at the Governor's Mansion, Navy silver sets are located on board actively serving Navy ships and submarines, as well as museums and other places of importance around the world. Each piece is truly a shining legacy of our naval history. The Navy is full of traditions, of which presentation silver is just one example. Naval customs and traditions like these build a bridge between young and old, past and present. And at the Puget Sound Navy Museum in Bremerton, we explore the many unique traditions that make our U.S. Navy. And I'd like to invite you all to visit the museum to get a taste of what it's like to live and work as a sailor. Uh, today is a great opportunity for us to share USS Olympia's presentation silver with you all. We hope you enjoy seeing these beautiful pieces and learning more about the Navy's rich history and heritage. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Shanna Stevenson uh, for more about the USS Olympia and her silver set. Thank you. That's a great background for uh, the next part of our presentation, which is really about the cruiser USS Olympia and uh, the long and winding road, I guess you would call it, of the silver. Well, the construction of the cruiser USS Olympia was part of a naval modernization plan that was author authorized in the 1880s. Planning for the ship began in 1889, the same year that Washington became a state. Union Iron Works of San Francisco won the contract to build the ship and laid the keel in 1891, and the ship was launched November 5, 1892, underwent sea trials, and then was commissioned in 1895. So how did the Olympia get its name? Well, there's an interesting story about that, and I'll let Senator and Territorial Governor Watson C. Squire tell the story. When I was in the Senate, Benjamin F. Tracy, the then Secretary of the Navy, sent for me. I called on him and he said, Senator, we have a new cruiser and we want to name it after one of the cities in your state, Washington. Will you make the selection? Well, I said, Mr. Secretary, you've given me a very delicate task. I live in Tacoma. If, if I say Tacoma, the people of Seattle will be sore. Spokane might do, but she's a rival of both Tacoma and Seattle. I'll tell you what I'll do. Olympia is a nice little place, and the people there will appreciate the compliment. Then, too, neither Tacoma, Seattle, or Spokane can find any fault. All right, Senator, replied Mr. Tracy. Olympia, it shall be. An announcement of the name uh, was made October 13th, 1892. Well, after service in Asia, the ship's fame was secured during the Battle of Manila Bay during the Spanish-American War. On January 3rd, 1898, Commodore George Dewey came aboard and raised a flag on the Olympia as the flagship of the squadron. The U.S. declared war with Spain on April 5th, 1898, primarily over the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor in February of that year. 
On May 1, 1898, at the Battle of Manila Bay in the Philippines, the American flotilla soundly defeated Spanish forces. In the early morning hours, Commodore George Dewey, who was on the Olympia's flying bridge, saw shore batteries firing at the advancing column of American ships. At 5.40 a.m., Dewey finally gave the order to the ship's captain, Charles Ridley, with the now famous words. You may fire when you are ready, Ridley. <laughs> Well, after news of the victory, two groups of Washingtonians began the quest for memorials for the ship. The mayor of Olympia sent greetings to Dewey immediately after the Manila Bay victory. But on May 4, 1898, Olympia residents gathered at a mass meeting at the Olympia Opera House, seen here, and determined to commemorate the victory and raise money for a statewide memorial. Well, why hadn't Olympia presented a gift to the ship previously? Well, it might be remembered that when the ship was commissioned in the 1890s, Olympia, like the rest of the state, was in a deep recession, which is likely why no memorials were sent at that time. Well, among those present at the Opera House gathering were representatives of the Women's Club of Olympia, including Abby Howard Hunt Stewart, who joined the effort for a fitting memorial for the victory. Well, during deliberations about memorials, others thought of another idea. Why not send Olympia beer? From the Washington Standard, August 12, 1898. A few days ago, some of the admirers of Admiral Dewey conceived the idea of presenting him with some souvenir and in casting about for something worthy of that high mission, the mind very naturally reverted to Olympia's best product. And that, despite the prejudice entertained against it by the ancient and venerated order of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, <laughs> despite that, it was Olympia beer. The credit for originating the idea, we believe, uh, belongs to Mr. Robert Frost. Mr. Uh, Leopold Schmidt, uh, of Capital Brewing Company generously donated the beer. The Northern Pacific Steamship Company offered to place it in Hong Kong uh, free for transportation. On October 23, 1898, uh, the, the Washington Standard carried a letter from Admiral Dewey, and it's uh, addressed from the flagship Olympia, Manila, September 20, 1898. Mr. Robert Frost, Olympia. Dear Sir, it afforded me much pleasure to accept six barrels of beer sent through our consul at Hong Kong and just received, which you were good enough to send to me as a present. I shall distribute it among the ships of the fleet that took part in the action of May 1st, and the health of yourself and those who contributed the beer will be drunk with enthusiasm. <laughs> Thank you again for the remembrance. I am very truly George Dewey. Well, City of Olympia activists organized a number of fundraisers for an Olympia memorial, and one of the biggest events was called the Mum Carnival. It was a week-long celebration at the Olympia Opera House held in the fall of 1898. Presenting uh, some of the uh, local, uh, some of the entertainment for the event was local songstress Addie Libby. The event was replete with beauty queens from around the state, flowers, song and dance, and among the most popular events of the carnival was a beautiful baby contest. <laughs> the city eventually raised over $1,900 to commission a tablet by Paul C. Morris, who was in the workshop of the famous sculptor Daniel Chester French. Images of the tablet were featured in national newspapers, gaining fame for the city. Meanwhile, some conflict was brewing when another effort for a memorial was organized in Seattle by Ada Levering Hanford. Olympia was seen as lacking in efforts to memorialize the ship in its victory. Breaking news, September 22nd, 1899, the New York Daily Tribune. It is a custom generally observed for the city or state after whom a battleship is named to present a service of silver to the vessel soon after it is placed in commission. That the Olympia did not receive the usual compliment 
does not reflect well on the good intentions of the citizens of Olympia. The capital city of Washington is a small and far from wealthy town situated at the head of Puget Sound. Only light draft steamers are able to reach its wharves and its sole claim of being a seaport are its oyster beds, which are extensive and furnish the best quality of oysters around the south. Well, after receiving some information from Ms. Hanford about her efforts, uh, do a reply. On January 1st, 1899, the Seattle Post Intelligencer carried uh, Admiral Dewey's letter, and I quote, As regards the matter of a testimonial to the flagship Olympia, I must confess to having felt that the city of Olympia had not done its duty by its namesake. Inasmuch as all up the other vessels of the squadron had been in some way honored by the cities from whom they took their names, it was an invidious comparison that the largest and best should be undervalued. I have no personal interest in the matter, however, and should any testimonial be sent hereafter to the Olympia, I will probably not be on board. Your suggestion as to the punch bowl designed as a trophy of the Battle of Manila seems to me an admirable one and would no doubt meet with hearty appreciation on board the Olympia. Well, Olympians were not very happy, and I want to say, as this image shows, Olympia was not such a backwater in the 1890s. John Miller Murphy spoke for Olympia residents in responding to Dewey's comments. Washington Standard, January 3rd, 1899. Editor John Miller Murphy. If the Admiral is fully advised, it is an unkind cut. While it is true that the city of Olympia did not present a souvenir to the now famous cruiser when launched, there were reasons for the apparent oversight. In the order given to Mr. French for a tablet that will be a work of art, unsurpassed in appropriateness and merit, the citizens of Olympia have amply atoned for their alleged indifference and neglect. Well, the organizer of the silver fundraising campaign was the woman Ada Levering Hanford. She was the daughter of Cornelius and Clara Baldwin Hanford. She was 22 when she spearheaded this effort. It's unclear uh, how she came to lead the campaign. She was very active in the social scene in Seattle. She'd attended the University of Washington, and she had an Olympia connection since her mother's family was from Olympia. Her father was a previous territorial Supreme Court justice and was at the time of the Olympia Silver Project a federal judge. Ada Hanford was assisted by several other luminaries of the social scene from Seattle, including Caroline Burke, Sarah Ferry, Amelia Hayden, Susan Henry, Matilda Allen, and Bill Haynes. Ms. Hanford proclaimed, Seattle Times, October 28, 1898. It is within the power of nearly everyone in the state to give something. And it is their duty as patriotic and self-respecting people to give as much as possible. It is hoped to raise $3,000 in Seattle, $2,000 in Tacoma, $3,000 in Spokane, $1,000 in Walla Walla, and $2,000 from the other cities of the state. Well, among the, the prominent fund contributors were railroad magnate James J. Hill, Seattle Brewing and Malting, Frederick Nelson and Monroe, Seattle National Bank, Sons of the American Revolution, the Hanford family, and the Republic Mining Camp donated $230. By uh, early 1899, funds were raised and a selection committee organized. Among the members were Ada Hanford, uh, Thomas Burke, C.H. Hanford, uh, all of Seattle, J.C. Drake and D.A. Murray of Tacoma, C.P. Chamberlain and Alonzo M. Murphy of Spokane, and John B. Libby of Port Townsend. The committee met in Judge Hanford's chambers in Seattle and they spent hours uh, studying the designs and deliberating. Design proposals were from Silversmith Gorham, Wedding Manufacturing, Howard Sterling, Wallace, and Graham and Moore, who were agents for Shreve and Company of San Francisco. The committee decided in favor of the design submitted by Shreve and Company. They had made the silver for the ship San Francisco, and fittingly, the firm was from the same city where the ship was built. 
and they actually started the designs as soon as Ada Hanford began uh, the work on the design for the silver. The Seattle Post Intelligencer on February 12, 1899, described the winning design by Shreve & Company. While the decorations are designed especially for the Olympia, the style of the pieces are modeled after a pattern of the period of George II. The decoration of oak leaves and acorns was selected upon the advice of the United States naval contractor who had charge of building the Olympia, being so symbolic of strength. The acorn is an insignia of rank. Combined with the oak leaf border, there will be medallions representing the seal of the Navy, the American Jack, the seal of the state of Washington, a reproduction of Stewart's portrait of George Washington. By special permission, the die for this will be made by G Charles E. Barber of the Philadelphia Mint. Shreve and Company have had the advice of experienced naval people, and all the articles have been selected with reference to their practical use on board. The engraving of the large metal tray inscribed with the names of the crew on board the ship during the Battle of Manila Bay, May 1st, 1898, was done by the noted engraver Charles Bonjon of Shreve and Company. Another special element of the silver was the victory statuette designed by noted California sculptor Douglas Tilden. Tilden had an interesting uh, history. After a bout with scarlet fever, he lost his hearing and ability to speak at age four. He attended the California School for the Deaf and studied in Paris with deaf sculptor Paul Chopin. An activist for the deaf community, Tilden created many San Francisco and California sculptures. He's sometimes called the Michelangelo of the West. The winged statue of victory, intended to commemorate the victory of May 1898, was modeled for Shreve and Company, especially for this service by Douglas Tilden, whose reputation was of the highest. This figure is so arranged that it can be easily transferred from the top of the punch bowl to the centerpiece. <coughs> this trophy, symbolic of victory, will have a far greater significance than would a reproduction of the battle scene itself. The cost of the 27-piece silver service was $8,750, about $246,000 in today's money, and a total of $10,000 was raised. The surplus funds were used for a special library for the USS Olympia, and the silver was completed mid-year, 1899. And a special element of the set was that the material to be used is to be of native production, the silver and gold used in it, from the mines of the state of Washington. Reportedly, the silver and gold used to fabricate the silver came from Republic Washington, and the miners and mine owners, as I mentioned, had contributed heavily to the fundraising campaign. After the service of the ship during the Spanish-American War, the Olympia arrived in New York on September 26, 1899, and this newsreel is of Dewey on the ship. Seattle Post-Intelligencer, Wednesday, September 27, 1899. Article, Washington's gift to the Admiral's ship is early placed on board her. New York, September 26. When the arrival of the Olympia was made known this morning, the reception committee immediately communicated with Rear Admiral Philip at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Philip detailed Lieutenant Dewey, nephew of the Admiral, to go upon the Navy Yard tug and proceed to Sandy Hook to meet the Admiral. The tug carried, besides the mail, the Manila medals for officers and crew, and the silver service for the ship presented by the efforts of Miss Hanford of Seattle. The tug also had the bronze tablet for the ship presented by the citizens of Olympia, Washington, from which the ship received her name. 
Morning Olympian, October 6, 1899, Fame of Olympia. One of the ceremonies which have made the arrival of the Olympia to American waters is a notable event was the presentation of a tablet by the citizens of the city of which Dewey's flagship was named. This memorial, designed by Paul W. Morris under the direction of Daniel C. French, will occupy a place on the Olympia's forward turret between the two big guns. The tablet bears, in a scroll, Dewey's historic words, Gridley, you may fire when ready. And below it, from the citizens of Olympia and the state of Washington, greetings of Olympia to her namesake, 1898. Uh, this, these are images from the Seattle Times of the silver aboard the USS Olympia in 1902, resplendent in display cases in the captain's cabin. And the USS Olympia silver is special because it is both a presentation set and also commemorates a famous naval battle. The Olympia went on to serve in various capacities over many years, including service in the Caribbean, the North Atlantic during World War I, Murmansk, and the Adriatic. One of the highlights of the ship's service was returning the body of the unknown soldier after World War I in October and November 1921. The ship carried the body from La Havre to the Washington Navy Yard, and here is the moving footage of the ship's service to return the body. So, uh, the Olympia was finally uh, decommissioned in uh, 1922, and for a time the silver was used on the carrier USS Saratoga. After several years, locals organized for congressional action to return the silver to the city of Olympia on loan from the Navy. Efforts were launched in 1930 through John Rhea, a former <laughs> editor of the Olympia newspaper, and supported by then Congressman Albert Johnson from Grays Harbor to return the silver to Olympia. After making its way through Congress, the bill finally passed in June 1930 and was signed by then President Hoover. HB 4206, an act authorizing the Secretary of the Navy in his discretion to loan to the city of Olympia, state of Washington, the silver service set formerly in use on the U.S. cruiser Olympia be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the Secretary of the Navy is authorized in his discretion to loan to the City of Olympia, State of Washington, for preservation and exhibition the silver service set formerly in use on the United States Cruiser Olympia. 
provided that no expense shall be incurred by the United States for delivery of such silver service set. <laughs> Approved June 30th, 1930. After passage of the bill, a formal request is made by the Maribel Olympia to the Navy for the silver. After completion of the request, the silver was sent from the Saratoga to the Naval Supply Depot at San Diego and then redirected to the Bremerton Navy Yard. On September 15, 1931, the Olympia City Council minutes recorded the following. A communication from the Commandant Navy Yard, Puget Sound, stating that the Silver Service is now packed and ready for shipment and the cost of handling and packing to Olympia will be $24.78. <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce is ready to take care of the expense of the packing to wit. $24.78 and the Commissioner of Public Works having consented to sending to Bremerton one of the city trucks to bring the silver set and cabinet to Olympia. Well, the silver was delivered in early October 1931 and it was on display in cooperation with the Chamber of Commerce and for a time was stored in state vaults, but it was decided that it should be in the governor's mansion. Then Governor Clarence Martin thanked the city for the loan. February 13, 1933. To his honor the mayor and the honorable city council of the city of Olympia. Gentlemen, that salutation certainly dates it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the state of Washington hereby receipts for a quantity of silverware which was loaned to the city of Olympia by the commandant of the Navy Yard at Bremerton. The list is attached here too. I fully appreciate this favor, and I know that the state joins with me in thanking you. A notification is also being sent to the Commandant of the Navy Yard at Bremerton so that he too will know what disposal has been made of the silver service from the USS Olympia. Cordially yours, C.D. Martin, Governor of Washington followed by February 21st, 1933, Olympia City Council Minutes. In accordance with arrangements heretofore made between the city of Olympia and Governor Martin, the silverware and cabinets were loaned to the governor for exhibition and use in the governor's mansion. Well, John Rhea also tried in 1933 to have the tablet returned to the city of Olympia that although federal legislation was introduced, the tablet stayed with the ship where it remains today. Well, the silver is a highlight of the mansion. Although the decor of the dining room has changed over the years since 1933, as seen in these images, the silver has been a notable showpiece of the mansion and remains as a pivotal element of weekly public tours and events at the mansion. Social functions in the governor's mansion are enhanced by the artistically beautiful silver service gracing the table and buffet in the formal dining room. Efforts were made in the 1940s to return the ship to the city of Olympia, but in 1957, the title was transferred to the Cruiser Olympia Association in Philadelphia, where the ship remains today. The state again looked at the option of the return of the ship in the 1980s. There have been requests to return the silver to the ship during Governor Rosalini's administration, as well as during the Evans administration. And Governor Evans expressed the feelings many share when asked to send the silver to Philadelphia. This letter is dated October 26, 1970, and it's addressed to the Veterans Advisory Commission, Philadelphia. The city, by formal Council action placed it, the silver, in the executive mansion for use and permanent display. It is there today, used for state functions, and I am certain that there would be serious reaction to any attempt to move this memory of the cruiser. In fact, many citizens here suggest that the cruiser itself belongs in Olympia, Washington, yeah. <laughs> where it has obvious ties. Sincerely, Daniel J. Evans, Governor. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 
the uh, silver was retired in the early 2000s for use in the mansion because of its value, but most pieces are on permanent display in the dining room. You'll be seeing them all here in a minute. Well, the, the U.S. Uh, Olympia submarine, SSN-717, was commissioned November 17, 1984, and this time the city of Olympia was quick to respond with presentation <laughs> silver. Then Secretary of State Ralph Monroe worked with local leaders and businesses to raise funds for a set of presentation silver supplied by Olympia's Panowitz jewelers and other gifts which uh, Monroe delivered personally when the ship was commissioned. Funds for the silver were raised by operators of Western Washington McDonald's restaurants with the assistance of the Panowitz family who engraved the set. Uh, Governor Spellman and then Mayor of Olympia, Dave Scranstad, with other Olympians, joined Secretary Monroe for the commissioning. And I want to introduce uh, Rob and Leslie Panowitz, who are with us today. Well, Governor Spellman also presented the ship with a piece of the original USS Olympia Silver, creating a link between the 1890 ship and the SSN 717, USS Olympia, the state of Washington, and the city of Olympia. I, John Spellman, hereby entrust to the care and custody of the officers and crew of the submarine Olympia, SSN 717, this silver trade, which served the officers and crew of the cruiser USS Olympia from 1899 to 1922. It has served the state in the executive mansion as it will uh, when returned upon the decommissioning of the submarine Olympia. We, the people of Washington, are pleased that we can participate in maintaining the historic link that has long existed between the U.S. Navy and our state, 10th day of February, 1984. The Olympia remains at the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia. It's the world's oldest floating steel ship and is the sole surviving ship from the Spanish-American War. It's also a National Historic Landmark. And here's some images uh, from the museum. <coughs> the tablet donated by the city of Olympia remains at the Philadelphia Museum. And I want to thank them for sending these images of the tablet for this presentation. Well, we really celebrate the continuing connection of the state of Washington, uh, the city of Olympia, with the naval history of its namesakes. And we're so pleased to have Captain Schrader and Mayor Selby here with us today, reflecting that long connection. And you'll be delighted to see the full array of USS Olympia silver on display in the dining room and uh, there will be refreshments as well. And I want you to encourage you to visit our gift shop, which is set, set up in the um, uh, uh, front parlor here. Um, uh, also notice our current exhibit of contemporary art by noted Washington artists on display on the first floor. And if you're intrigued and want to have a full tour of the mansion, tours are available most Wednesdays through the Department of Enterprise Services Tour Office. And if you're not already a Mansion member, uh, uh, Governor's Mansion Foundation member, please consider joining us as we continue uh, to work to preserve and enhance uh, the People's House of Washington. I want to give a special thanks to the committee who helped organize the event. Will you all stand? Their names are in the program. Uh, and special thanks to our presenters. I think they did a great job. Yeah, as well. <laughs> and uh, Cap Captain Schrader and Megan and Marcel, please come forward. We have some mementos for you. And I want to say that Les Eldridge has also some t-shirts and other things from the Friends of the Olympia. And we'll fit those to you after we're done here. But the uh, work wearing a, a proudly wearing a t-shirt. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming. Shanna, if I may, uh, there are several distinguished members of the Friends of the Olympia present today. Uh, Chief Justice Alexander. 
former Mayor Fouch, and from our steering committee, uh, the noted maritime historian and author of the recent book, Maritime Olympia in South Puget Sound, John Huff, seated next to the mayor. on behalf of everybody here at Ford County Committee. If uh, you can, make it up here, that'd be great. Um, as you can probably imagine, Shannon has spent countless hours putting this together, getting material and data from a variety of sources, and I think she did an excellent job. Uh, I won't go on too long, because I know you want to have some cookies and tea and see the actual silver. But there's one thing I'd like to point out. This is where Shannon is so brilliant. Shannon is a professional historian. She's a published author. She's a curator of the museum. We are very fortunate to have her in charge of this project. I wrote down something that I think is worth noting to end this uh, session. It's important to study history. Why? It's to remember what happened to understand how it affects the present, and to anticipate the future. So thank, Shanna, thank you for helping us remember. And these are from your committee. Thank you very much. And uh, please uh, adjourn to the dining room uh, and enjoy uh, refreshments and see the beautiful silver.